Hello everybody, uh, welcome along to another one of these photo speed photographer chats and uh, myself and Tim are delighted to be joined by the man, the legend, the myth and I'm, I'm actually, especially Paul, bearing in mind this is a chat about black and white, I'm amazed your colour is even showing you, your camera is showing you in colour, it's Paul Sanders, hello Paul. <laughs> Hello, both of Hello. you. It's really nice of you to be here. I did try and turn it black and white, but I can't. Oh, okay. Well, so you just have to have to imagine me as 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 grey man, as monochromatic Paul. But I what mean, about I you? Actually, I'm quite grey. <laughs> <laughs> I always say I'm. I'm always when whenever we do a video with you, Paul. I just I'm so jealous of your your little studio at the back and thing. I just oh, it's... well, it's an oasis of calm. I My just, um, like, yeah. Yeah, my, my plant there, I bought that at the beginning of lockdown. And um, it, I think, I honestly think it's going to try and eat me at some point. Because it's just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. My bonsai tree is very happy. And that's sitting on top. You can't see the bonsai tree because it's down there because it's only little bonsai tree. But that's sitting on top of my little little thing with my tomato seeds and my broad beans. Mm. And who knew you would turn into uh, gardening hour here, everybody? But behind Paul, on his on his other shoulder, is a oh, printer. Yeah, and we, oh, look at that, everybody! We're going to talk about that because there's a bit of a background story to that. And um, we're going to Paul, talk about Paul. It, Paul, it looks like it's still got some of the plastic on it. Is it? <laughs> oh, okay. um, that the red tag. Yeah. Um, it says "Do not remove." How oh, does it? So I haven't. Yeah, <laughs> just don't remove in case you in case you need to travel with your printer. I'm not going to say anything because this will go out on the yeah. So yeah, okay. yeah. Okay, well, oh, I haven't removed it. <laughs> it's like one of those labels that says "remove before flight," mm -hmm. but yeah, it says "do not remove." So I've left it. Okay. He is a rule. If nothing else, he is a, a rule follower, which at this point of time is probably not a bad thing. Um, well, yeah. Let's mo let's move on from any controversy there. Um, we, why we got Paul on was obviously just for hilarity, hilarity and banter of, is the main reason, of course. Um, but we obviously do monthly uh, focuses with photo speed, and uh, in April it is monochrome and black and white imagery. And so, as part of our kind of um, chats about black and white, we thought, well, we know someone who loves a bit of black and white, and we thought we'll chat to Paul about his black and white work, black and white generally, and a little bit uh, as well with Tim about printing black and white paper, why it's probably not as complicated as you might think it is, and some other things as well. So, that's the plan. But, Paul, yes, I think. Probably the most obvious question, and, and I'm one for the low-hanging fruit, um, is... <laughs> <laughs> Do you take that fruit, Sam? Go on. <laughs> journalistically. Um, <laughs> why, why black and white? That's the obvious thing, bearing in mind this conversation. For you, yeah. why, why is it always black and white? I'm going to reply to that with a question for you. Why not? Touché. <laughs> <laughs> um, why black and white? <laughs> Well, really, I, it's simplicity. Um, I, when I first started in photography, it was all everything. It was black and white film. I have a very deep love of um, black and white because of the the simplicity of what it does. It's it's uh, it's about content. It's a, it's about the texture, the feel, the mood, the emotion, um, and I can't create that in color. I've tried. And I fail miserably. Uh, part of it is because you have to get up quite early in the morning to do kind of like lovely golden hour. And and I, to be honest, I don't rate it. You know, golden hour is it's, you know, it's all right. But I'd much rather get up a bit later and have a misty morning or go out in the rain and do, you know, my kind of slightly lost black and whites or photograph the flowers in the garden. Um, because I'm looking then at the, the texture, the feel, the, um, you know, the sort of the structure, the, the line, and I'm not saying color photographers don't look at that. Um, but for me, that's what I, what I'm looking for and the color just gets in the way. So I enjoy the simplicity of black and white, it, you know, when all is said and done. Um, and I, I genuinely find color pictures quite irritating. 
Um, and I know that's contra. I know it's controversial. I know it is. <laughs> um, you know, we're all with friends here. <laughs> yeah, but people, a lot of people aren't subtle with their colour. Mm. You know, they they. If you look around, yes, there are times that the colours really do sing, but often they're very gentle. They're very subtle. They're suggestive. They're hints of. You know, with reflected colours in the shadows, and um, and a lot of colour photography for me loses that delicacy because people go, "I want this to be really good, so I'll whack up the clarity, I'll whack up the saturation, um, I'll hit the vibrancy for as much as I can, and then I'll whack in a load of texture, and then I'll save it, do a virtual copy, and do it all again." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I like, you know, with black and white, yes, you can go heavy and you can overdo it in the same way. But I, I like, you know, I always think less is more. Mm. Um, and if I was a colour photographer, I would be doing very, very little in terms of the, you know, the, the process to it. Um, you know, but I'm not saying that all people who photograph in colour before you get thousands of letters from the one person who's going to watch us. <laughs> 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 but you know there are photographers out there who handle color very very carefully and their work mm. is beautiful um but for me it's not something i personally as a photographer can achieve in my work um and it's another level of thought and i don't have that level of mental capability would you as say you it's know, just something that doesn't kind of is it something that just doesn't really work for you, would you say? Is that kind of it's yeah. just not the way you think? That's a, yeah, so I know for me, I work a lot in mono. and things. That's just the way I work. I don't know yeah. why. Um, I, I completely agree. It's not the way I see the world. Um, it's a little bit like a personality clash with somebody. You know, it, it just, there's that kind of, it is like a repulsion for me. That's actually quite. That's quite hard. Mm. Isn't it? Okay, we're, we're dialing it up, Paul. Um, just, yeah. just, a, just a question. Just a question, though, Paul, because I know you're. You know, you've been a photographer um, for many years. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to say that in a nice way, in terms of very experienced. But uh, and, yeah. and you studied and all, and and all the rest of it. So I wonder, back then and now, um, from a influence point of view of photographers, you might have enjoyed the work of. And I know you're someone that gets influences from lots of different places, but we're just yeah. speaking specifically about photography. Is that true of your, 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 the work you enjoy viewing in the past and now? Is that strictly more towards the black and white side? Or, or can you see particular colour work and think, yep, yeah, I can engage and enjoy that, but it's just not what I would do. You know what I mean? Yeah, it, it's funny you should say that because I do enjoy looking at other photographers who shoot black and white, but I actually really get a lot of pleasure out of looking at colour photography because it's something that I don't do. Hmm. Um, and I, I enjoy seeing the work of people who, who produce color work that has emotion, that has feeling, that has a depth of connection that is more than just, here's a picture with a load of color in it. You know, they, hmm. they, use, um, they use color to, to bring out the, you know, their depth of feeling about what they're doing, which is what I try to do in my black and white work. But I love to see it done in colour. So when I when I look through, um, you know, Instagram or whatever, I'm always looking at and exploring the work of people who shoot in colour because I think it's very good to look at things that you don't do yourself, to draw inspiration from, to 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 try and unpick if you like a little bit of of what it is about the you know that image that you you really enjoy um, so yes i have a lot of black and white photography books by all manner of photographers but i have a lot of color um work most of the color work that i look at at the moment to be honest is color portraiture um and, and i find that fascinating because i don't shoot people so I don't really like doing colour and I don't like doing people and there I am. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Looking at work. Right. Wow. <laughs> but I love it. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder, I mean, in in years gone by, I suppose there was this, you know, for many years, and maybe I think it still is around to some degree in the in the 
potentially in the higher education side of things or in the art world side of things, especially in different countries, that black and white was always revered um, as as more of a serious art form as well, wasn't it, historically? And I yes. mean, uh, yeah. I wonder how that, has changed because color a lot of old the old film photographers the masters as it were if we want to call them that you know a lot of them had issues with <coughs> color couldn't quite connect with it there were technical challenges because of the film types that were being used and they were awkward weren't they so yeah. i mean do you, do you think still black and white has that possibility to be more uh, seriously held up rightly or wrongly but do we still think there's that uh, attached to it uh, i think in some places yes but generally no I, I think now photography is so democratized that people respect and enjoy um i'm going to say quality photography mm. um uh, you know they enjoy work that that touches them sort of here it used to be that black and white would touch people there but we live in a color world um and the majority of people are you know they see in color they experience their life in color um so when they're presented with a color picture i think they can see that as art um you know mm. if you look at the work of uh you know like chris Friel and val de bailey doug chinnery that's all you know color and it's stunning you know it, it pulls you in and draws questions out of you um elicits an emotional response that you know it's that's art yeah um yeah. and I, I think black and white photography does that too but it does it in a different way <clears throat> i think it comes from the documentary world and yeah. the magnum and all that kind of stuff hmm. um about um uh, it's it's almost a class thing in a way isn't it I don't know mm. I, I, there's loads of books written about it but i won't get into that um <laughs> <laughs> i think it, i think it was i think it i, I think, think it was it more so I than it is now yeah the color photography was linked back to that cheap family snapshot and i think mm. yeah. that that was yeah. that whole thing and i remember yeah i'll go back about the whole martin parr getting into magnum fiasco kind of not fiasco but very well done for getting in but um they didn't want him in they didn't want him in did they let's be honest um yeah. so it was well they do now obviously they yeah. <laughs> relish him but well i think that's, at that time yeah i think the main thing you know and that's kind of the point we, i kind of wanted to get mm. to <clears throat> was that really it's about genuine quality of, of work and that can yeah. come in at you in any type and any way in any media in any format so, I mean, whilst we like black and white and we're here to talk about black and white, we I kind of wanted to make that point that really it's it's genuinely good photography that will always carry through whatever it is. But yeah, it is. But, you know, just if I can just if you look at the work of Saul Leiter, you, I think you, you've not met yes. him, Sam, but, you know, no. he's one of the people <laughs> that we would have interviewed on our former thing. Had we? Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, but he has a body of work in black and white and a body of work in colour. And you can't say one is better than the other. They're different. Yeah. And that's that's the way that we, we should view it. You know, it's like Monet isn't Turner and you know, Rembrandt isn't Cezanne and you know, they're all different. So we have to view them in their own right and and not judge them or compare them necessarily, but just work on the basis that is it good photography? Does it does it elicit an emotion from the viewer? in some way um yeah. uh, and so for me i i think yeah like we said earlier it's the quality over mm. over the sort of uh, i'll call it a, a genre it's not really a genre is it um no but i know word? i know what you, you know mean. what yeah, I what's the word, Sam? You're clever. I, 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 I know what you mean. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Category? Category? Ca ca yeah, maybe, yeah. maybe. I think, yeah. well, okay, well, I think <laughs> with that established, let's say, with that established, which is kind of more of a background about about black and white, I just, I know there'll be photographers watching, obviously. Um, we hope and, so. And, well, yeah, hopefully there's anyone. <laughs> um, and hopefully people who are, are keen about getting out and shooting and all the rest of it. So, I'm just intrigued. I don't want to get into a, a, a tech conversation at all, but I'm intrigued about your sort of working process, Paul, when you're out. Yeah. Uh, I know maybe from from your general approach, being a bit more mindful in how you approach areas like that. But I'm thinking it from a black and white, my black and white hat on. Yeah. We often talk, don't we, about seeing 
in black yeah. and white and there's there's ways we can physically do that on our cameras to, these days yeah. and there's equipment we can use so are you always for example viewing things through your camera in a black and white mode preview already or yes. are you not and things like this so maybe just if you can outline a little bit of that when you're in the field yeah so i think whatever photography you do you you should do it with intention so for me i photograph in black and white so my camera is set to black and white so i see in the uh, the viewfinder or on the screen a black and white reproduction of what i'm shooting um and i i do that because a lot of people say oh it's not work so i'll turn it black and white and if you don't go out with the intention of trying to photograph something in black and white actually you, you see it differently you receive it very differently so i i look at the world around me which obviously is color but i then assess the color in terms of what tone it will make so when people talk about oh i see in black and white actually i see in color but in my head and through the camera I turn it black and white and I'm already thinking about how I want it to look when I print it. So mm -hmm. do I want the greens to be dark? Do I want the yellows to be light? Do I want the reds to be, you know, sort of sit in the middle? Um, and it's not a technical process in terms of, you know, where the exposure is going to sit or anything like that. It's, it's purely an aesthetic. How do I want those tones to look in the finished process? in the finished image. How do I want these colors to reproduce as tones? So that's why often I don't, I don't shoot at dawn and dusk purely because the, the colors are quite muted and, um, and then they go a bit muddy. Mm. So I, I, I find that difficult to handle. Although I think I've sent you a sunset picture, Tim, I think. We'll we're gonna, uh, we're gonna, well, we're gonna walk through <laughs> some of the images as well, aren't we? Yeah. So, um, but it, you know, for me, it, it's it's looking at the the line and the texture of the of the subject there, the the pattern, the repetition, the shadow, the light, the shade, all of those things, and that's a moonrise, mate. <laughs> 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 it was the one on there. It's fine. It's, <laughs> it's similar. That's the sunset. That's the sunset. Yeah, there we go. Oh, I <laughs> you know, what I love about this is that we are we are so fly by the seat of our pants that nobody quite knows <laughs> what's going to happen. <laughs> 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 well, we're going we're going for that raw reaction. Yeah. You know, at point over yeah, over rehearsing yeah, yeah. the uh, passion out of it. <laughs> yeah. um, so. Sorry, Paul. I, I sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I was gonna, with when, and we'll maybe in a minute we'll we'll we might just chat about a couple of these images because mm. I also know that whilst you're looking at those things, you're looking at the tones and the density of things, but you're also relating back to the emotion that you're then trying to get through the image. So, and, and we'll, we'll, yeah. maybe we'll come to that when we talk about them. But in just from the practicals of, you know, you've you've led many workshops, tours, help people on retreats, and all sorts of things. So. I would imagine people come to you and sometimes say, and correct me if I'm wrong, you know, I'd like to do more with black and white or I enjoy your black and white or I feel, you know, I, I don't see as well in black and white. Are there things you think people struggle with commonly and or yeah. any things that you can do to open the door a bit to them on that? I know some of it we will have touched on. Yeah, I mean, one of the big things is people's understanding of colour and how colour works. And it, it sounds, it always sounds really odd as, as somebody who specializes in black and white to talk about how color works, because it, it, it's important that you understand where colors sit in relation to each other. So as to whether they're going to have any contrast. So I'll often give people a color circle and I'll say, look at where red is, look at where purple is, look at where yellow is, where orange, you know, look at those things so you can see what you know if you lighten your yellow areas for the sake of argument then the color that's opposite that will probably end up wanting to be a bit darker so if you can understand how color contrast works you can bring that through in tonal values and 
it's not as complicated as you think it is because if you think of you know a white mug and a black mug there's contrast you know they're opposite each other so all you're doing is saying well here's red here's green here's blue here's orange or you know whatever it is and and you're just playing with those those concepts as to how they might look and and you know one of the things that i do with uh, some people now is I'll just bring, uh, you know, like an apple, an orange, a pepper, um, you know, an aubergine, you know, a, a few bit, a few bits of the, mm. few bits, of, and say photograph them, and then let's play with the color, you know, but play with and the ter in terms of black and white, because in the old days, black and white films saw color, mm. you know, it, it saw red, green, and blue. And if we wanted to darken a sky, we'd put a red filter because it would darken down the blues, but it would lift the reds. You know, the reds would be lighter. If you put a green filter on, um, you know, it lightens up some of the greens. You know, and, and all these things, I, I'm lucky in some ways because I mean, come through that sort of film thing where you kind of mess around with all these things in front of the lens. It actually, I think, makes it easier to do and I take a lot a lot of my experience for granted now almost and it's only when I'm explaining to people things that I I I stop and I realize actually how lucky I am to have have learned through the the art of doing a black and white film shooting with different color filters um and and processing it to to bring out the things and changing the grades of paper in the dark room and all the rest of it and i think now actually digital black and white photography is so much easier it's so yeah. simple um you yeah, know and it, it it's great great fun and yet people get a bit scared of it or they use it like i said earlier as a get out of jail free card because it's like oh well i'll i'll turn it black and white because i i've cocked it up but actually, if they'd gone out with the intention of shooting it in black and white to start with, they would probably have had an even finer image than the saving saving image, because you just think about it slightly differently. Mm -hmm. So I will always set the camera at the aspect ratio that I'm shooting, which is usually square. I'll always set it to black and white. And because I've got a, a Fuji film, it's normally the across red setting, because that shows me on the screen the contrast I like. Yeah, it doesn't actually do very much in terms of adjusting the the way the colors reproduce as as tones, but it, it gives me a nice contrast to look at. So I have an I have an idea of of where I'm going with it. Yeah, um, yeah, and like like you say, nowadays that's that's much easier when you can actually see it right there in front of you, and that will affect yeah. how yeah. you shoot and how you see things and all the rest of it. Yeah. So um, just out of interest, Paul, before we just jump into some of the images, do you do you use? Is there any particular, if you don't mind me asking, are there any particular apps or things you use on your phone for shooting with? Not necessarily for the editing, but is there anything you shoot with on your iPhone much, or do you just use the iPhone camera and off you go? I just use the iPhone camera. Yeah. Um, I do you know. I can't be bothered with all the apps. It's fiddly, isn't it? You just want to swipe and bang. Yeah, I, I like the. For me, the phone is a sketchbook, and I, I love the the instant access to the camera. And without opening the the thing and logging in, and I I can just go in, I photograph, and then with the it's interesting with the phone. I tend to photograph in color and then convert, mm. rather than putting mm. it on one of the black and white <clears throat> settings. <laughs> Speed, <laughs> ease, let's say. It, yeah, it is. Um, but I'm still thinking when I'm photographing with my phone how it's gonna how the tones are gonna be affected. Yeah. yeah. So it's it's a thought process. Yeah. 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 So so well it leads me on really. On on your on your Fuji, I'm I'm not a Fuji yeah. user actually. I've gone the other route, the Rico route. But um I was Who? Rico, the GR. Oh, sorry, I thought you meant the photocopiers. Yeah, no. yeah, the same company, same company. Sorry, that, was, that was harsh, wasn't it? <laughs> it's the same company. Yeah, <laughs> they bought Pentax. That's the one. They did. Um, yes, you're right. <laughs> anyway, you make very nice <laughs> But um, do you is do you save the file, all the black and white information, and everything into the file, or do you convert? 
do you save a, like a reference, a JPEG, then you've got the RAWs, or how, how does it work on the Fuji? I'm not too sure. It's... Um, well, I, I photograph in RAW and JPEG. Hmm. So the RAW, obviously, is all the colour info. Yeah. Um, if I get the JPEG about right, then I might tweak the contrast and you know the brightness or the shadows, the highlights, or whatever, a little bit, and I'll print from that um because the files on the uh 100s are enormous mm -hmm. if i want to refine it i'll open the raw file and then i'll convert it through lightroom and i always use the same uh preset so i, I use the adobe uh black and white soft um preset which i personally for me works um it suits how i photograph um it allows me to recover some of the highlight detail that I probably will blow out because, you know. Shoddy workmanship. What, <laughs> what's exposure? <laughs> um, no, I just like the the gentleness of the of the tones. I will, you know, I'll probably change that at some point, and then I will use the black and white sliders in the um, in the develop module to just tweak the the colors up or down a little bit. And it's it's only a little bit of tweaking to get a big result. Um, if you over tweak them, you know it it looks horrendous. So it's it's very subtle. Less is always more, I think, in processing. Personally, mm, yeah, 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 definitely. Cool. Okay. Well, uh, Tim, should we put a couple of the images? Up? And maybe oh, I don't. No. We don't want to necessarily oh. go through each one in great detail Paul but I just thought if there's a you know if there's specific points we want to make or interesting things with regards either the the atmos or the situation or the tech or you know anything I mean um maybe well, that we talked about the sunrise situation as well and commonly yeah. I don't know if we can flick back to that Tim but you know I would imagine most landscape photographers or for outdoor photographers whatever, whatever you want to call it you know go to those light situations thinking in color i would imagine most people don't they you know would go from mm. that aspect so it's quite interesting to see this representation which obviously speaks more to your aesthetic uh, you know but, but uh, some of the reasons we've alluded to um yeah. it's that moss isn't it you're looking for, it's that connection of of mood at the time or yeah a little bit you see i mean i took this uh image i was away um for a, a couple of days with my dad and my dad shoots in color and he's obsessed with sunrises and sunsets bless him um and where we were standing i mean this is literally the the back of the house where we were pretty much staying and i don't normally do sunsets or sunrises particularly but i just thought it'd be really lovely to stand next to my dad and photograph the same thing that he was doing but do it in my way. Um, and uh, there was a love, you know, the whole thing about this for me, it's a, it was a lovely calm. It was the end of the uh, quite a long, long day that we'd had. Um, we were both a bit knackered, um, but it was really lovely just standing next to, to him, looking at what he was doing and what I was doing and seeing the way we both went around the, the thought process of what we were trying to get. I mean, our, our image is actually largely quite similar. Um, interestingly, although Dad's is in colour, and it was a gorgeous sunset. You know, the the sky was quite pink. The water was reflected pink and gold. Um, you know, but my father has opened up all the detail in the cliffs, whereas I've let it, let it go because I just wanted to lose it. And it's those little things that mean you can stand next to somebody and your picture of the same thing is completely different. It has a very different, you know, a very different mood. Um, mm. And and I, I quite enjoy, I quite enjoy that thing of standing next to people, photographing something, both people doing it in their own way, not being influenced or affected by what the other person is doing, not looking at the camera and going, actually, his is much better or you know looking at mine going mine's better than his they're different mm -hmm. and it's a different interpretation of the same thing in the same way that we're all affected by what's going on in the world but it affects us all differently based on uh our, you know different experiences up to that point so when we photograph 
to allow ourselves to to be our authentic selves and see how we see rather than being influenced by what other people are doing i think is really important mm, yeah. um, you know so so you know and i was asking myself do sunsets work in black and white all the while i was doing it do sunsets work in black and white um you know for why me not? yes yeah exactly yeah, why not i mean it's yeah. not the first sunset i've done in black and white and sometimes i do it just to be awkward um, <laughs> I, but... I can't Im i can't imagine that part, but i think <laughs> i think even just from from an aesthetic point of view shooting in black and white like that allows you a little bit more flexibility to bend the so-called rules as you yeah. alluded to with with the shadows uh, because it's some of that contrast and that mood that that can give is really quite strong and i think if you did that in color we both know that would probably be visually quite difficult to uh, stomach you know what i mean yeah. but in black and white it actually really adds to it as mm. opposed to yeah. being a being a problem um yeah. but tim let's have a flick through a couple more and then we'll just get paul's thoughts on and maybe a couple more and then um we all love a tree paul we all tree love in the a... mist, mate. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's well, like it's... a lot <laughs> i'm gonna go back <laughs> well i think you 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 know we joke about it but the image after even as well finding unique well fi everything is unique i think that's the point mm. especially i think you phil but finding subject matter which connects to you and then mm. letting that be the star i suppose that's that's the goal sometimes or to or to reflect yeah. your relationship to it and i suppose yeah. what we're what we're here with black and white is we're here to talk about how that might be a strong way to do that so you know in these instances you you've got that contrast we were talking about the black mug white mug yes uh, but, <laughs> but lots of subtlety within that as well right yeah i mean you don't the the subject is the star of the show the two of you work together so it's a collaboration um you know in, in some of the talks that i do I, I i describe it as a meeting of souls uh and it sounds you know when you say it out loud it sounds really pretentious but it's it's not pretentious because it's true i mean i believe that everything has an energy or a soul and when when two come together you form a um, a beautiful relationship and photography is about relationships it's about your relationship with the subject. It's about the relationship of the subject to the space. It's about the relationship of one tone to another. It's about the relationship of one line to another, one curve to another. You know, it's all about relationships. And often, often we forget that it's it's illustrating relationships. So I, I just try and play with the relationship that I have with things and the space that I put them in and, and how I feel about what i'm photographing and and how they feel perhaps about you know me photographing them hmm. um hmm. you notice the, the fritillary here it's turning away it's quite shy didn't really want to be photographed yes yeah, so there's a slightly <laughs> coy turn going on there isn't there i mean is it is it coy or is it a kind of come and get me look yes that's, that's the ambiguity and maybe actually maybe yeah. black and white does afford a little more ambiguity sometimes yeah. um you know but i i fell in i mean i, I fritilla is my favorite flower um and i i grow my own photographs you know i have a garden <laughs> seriously i have a no i know <laughs> filled with flowers that i photograph <laughs> <laughs> and i i think there's there's something about photographing things that mean a lot to you that you really care about um and you you notice little things i mean i i, I love the way the two leaves just come out the, that little mm. curve in the neck of it just before it reaches the 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 flower um yeah you know, there's, uh, there's a lot. Mm. that goes back to that sh shapes and curves and, and yeah. all those it allows that just to sing doesn't it but yeah. i think um, you made a really good point there paul about that connection and it's something tim and i've done a number of different chats with different mm. people in different ways of seeing the world but the same thing always crops up that when the photographer has a has a more meaningful connection with the subject matter or, or deeply cares about it or has learned more about it through an ongoing process yeah. you do you really can see that in the work and it's not a it's not a tangible thing where you can say oh it's because this is there or that's here or 
but mm. you know what I mean. You can yeah. you can see it, can't you? And that's yeah. a difficult one to explain verbally. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's. Um, I, I think you become very aware of the subject, and somehow, and this sounds really, really bizarre when I say it out loud. Somehow, the subject gives you a little bit more because it knows you paid attention, knows you care, knows you're interested. Um, yeah. you know, I think it's like if you do a portrait of somebody, you ask them some questions about themselves or you ask them their name, you get more out of them. Mm. You know, if you just see them as a photo opportunity, it's just a photo, a photo of, you know, a man who cleans boots in the station. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But when you take the trouble to engage on a different level, you know, to, to build that relationship it becomes a photograph about something yeah and and that's a that's a massive difference yeah and it goes back to that two-way street yeah. then isn't it yeah. because because yeah. both parties are sending vibes whatever it might exactly. be yeah. backwards and forwards yeah. as, a, as mm. opposed to a, a one pulling from the other or yeah yeah and i, th I think long-term projects yeah, that's why a lot of you know old older work that was done in the documentary fashion where people got sent on longer things or repeat mm. visits over many years, obviously then, you know, you, you scratch under the surface, you're going to get more and more connection yeah, from, yeah. from those images, yeah. which is hard now because pro for, professionally, no one's sending photographers to places on long assignments, are they, right? I mean, very, very few. And, and those guys, none, none, in fact, those guys are yeah. doing it themselves when they yeah. might know they can sell it to the New York Times or whoever it might be. Yeah. But no one's supporting that type of work, and maybe photographically, that's a challenge for for yeah. storytelling. Yeah, I think it is. It makes um, I think it makes the the longer term storytelling very very difficult, and a photographer has to care deeply about what they're doing to invest in it themselves, um, because it, it you know, it's expensive to get to places. It's often dangerous. They you know they need support. Mm. Um, and a lot of places now don't, you know, a lot of organizations don't offer that support to them. So they're not as inclined to go. Um, you know, you only have to you look at the work of someone like, you know, Tom Stoddard, who sadly, you know, died fairly recently. Mm. Um, amazing, amazing bodies of work built on relationships with the subject, with an area. Um, with a deep, deep understanding of what he was photographing and why he was photographing it. Yeah. Um, and the why is the thing that a lot of people don't ask, you know, why, why do I photograph? Why did I photograph this? Because I absolutely love those flowers. Yeah. No. Not because I thought it would make a great picture. No, no, but the, the why can be so, <laughs> the why can be so varied, but you're right. Yeah. It's absolutely the most important thing. Yeah. That I, that's why am I photographing it? And yeah. that used to be the key question as a news photographer. Why am I photographing this? You know, yeah. why, have you, why have I been sent? What is the story? What is the story of this thing that I am photographing? And that applies to portraits, to weddings, to still life, to landscape, you know, to cyanotypes, all areas of photography. The why am I photographing it is the is the driving question that enables you to get the picture that means something to you. Yeah. yeah good. Oh, uh, absolutely right. right. No, 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 no. It's all good stuff, Paul. I think what we'll do just as we sort of rally to, um, to a close, maybe well, Tim, if, already. yeah, well, listen, we just, you know, we're rock and roll in here, but I want to talk <laughs> about the printer. Um, Tim, if we can just maybe make it back to us on the screen, um, because uh, there's a, there's a story you've, you've recently, Fairly recent, isn't it, Paul? You've recently yes. took dive into the deep end on a on a big chap there. So what's this? What's the situation? Because uh, just cards on the table, Paul and I have obviously done many things over the years, and I know Paul does not love tech. He doesn't. He doesn't enjoy it. He doesn't want to know about it. He just wants it to work. And so <laughs> seeing you go big on the printer, I'm intrigued. Tell me. Well, I did have a lovely um, Epson uh, P800 to do my um, A2 prints. And uh, I bought it secondhand from Photospeed. A little bit like you buy a car from a dodgy salesman. So <laughs> I didn't buy it from Tim. I actually bought it from Vin. So you can tell I've got a salesman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think 
he allowed me to kick the tires to see if it was all right and it, i mean it's been really really good for about three or four years to be fair to it and produced beautiful prints but it started to um to just be temperamental and i thought i need a new one um so i measured my paper which is about 24 inches give or take a2 isn't it tim something like that yeah kind of <laughs> yes kind of. ish a bit thought, bigger a bit bit bigger 24 yeah, but yeah thought, rough roughly i need around about 24 inches mm. um so i looked on the website and i saw a printer that said 24 inches and i thought fantastic <laughs> it arrived on a pallet yes <laughs> <laughs> The instruction said, find six friends. To I mean, I was stuck there straight away. <laughs> yeah, um, you're stuffed, yeah. <laughs> so I, I ended up with a printer that was pro probably three times bigger than I needed because I was looking for a 24-inch printer. But once you've, you know, once you've pressed buy... <laughs> yeah, we won't it's, have it back. <laughs> you won't, no? Especially as I've taken it off the pallet. Yeah. I mean, how on earth would I get it back on the pallet? You sh I should have videoed us getting it in here um you know i mean the guy the guy carried it well he, he pushed on a little forklift trolley up the garden and and i said to him will you help he went don't be stupid yeah <laughs> <laughs> don't be stupid <laughs> i was like okay so uh, yeah but now colin i have to say colin produces the most beautiful print mm. he's not the fastest printer no but i always say slow and steady wins the race yeah um, and I uh like, it, it was, it's lovely. I mean, it's so easy. Tim actually helped me set it up and, and change the way I print over over the course of about an hour. Mm, really? In what way? In what way? Um, well, I used to print through Photoshop. And, you know, Tim set it all up so that it basically looks like it does on screen, which is fantastic because, I mean, it is 99.9% .9 there. And then we set up some little... Um, little previews and I had a bit of a lesson with Adrian Beasley mm -hmm. we all love Adrian Beasley um and uh, printing now for me is even simpler I mean it literally is print module print beautiful and that's what, that's what you want you know to me when I first started printing printing was a real nightmare because I couldn't I honestly couldn't make it work um and I used to send my work away and you know there was a great cost involved, but actually it robbed me of a really important part of the process, which is the printing. And to, to take an image from conception in the camera to all the way to effectively giving birth to it off the printer is unbelievably soul filling. You know, mm. I, I love it. I, I really enjoy the moment the printer clicks and I can lift the print off and I put it down and you can still smell the ink and the, the paper just has a slight dampness to it. And I think, oh, yeah. Uh, and just holding the paper, you know, it, it brings the, the whole image back to life in a way that it doesn't on screen. And people often say, oh, but they don't look as good on print. They, they're not. As, it's not that they're not as good. It's that they're, they're just different. Mm -hmm. And I, I think they're more alive as a as a print um you know they look great on screen because they're backlit but a print is alive it's a living thing you know that paper was once a living breathing tree at some point <laughs> <laughs> or whatever <laughs> else it made from god knows um <laughs> but it it has something magical about it that a screen just doesn't have yeah right. yeah and you're so your your Colin is he he's a twenty one hundred a Canon twenty one hundred is that Canon correct twenty one hundred okay. yeah um, I would say lighter printers are available yeah yes <laughs> <laughs> and, and um, I have and I, I have to I, say Paul the um, I was going to say Paul the um, the the Epson is heavier <laughs> the Epson equivalent of that size yeah yeah, yeah okay okay but yeah. I I mean black and white you know printing. Uh, like we've kind of alluded to there, I think that a lot of stuff gets talked about it and that it mm. can be hard or difficult to do at home. But I think actually with with the correct profiles, with a calibrated screen, with a proper print flow, yeah. it, it's absolutely possible to do amazing black and whites at home. Even if you can't mm. go up to a yeah. Canon 2100, I've got the Pro 300 here and anything even, a couple of models below that even, if you've got the right setup, 
it, it, yeah. you can do it and it and it's and it's like paul yeah. says it is a, a a great experience once you've got mm. your setup correct and we've done yeah. various videos tim's done on the first be youtube channel about how to set that up um and about queries with paper types as well i know paul actually i'm not sure paul do you what are you commonly using paper wise these days uh, platinum cotton platinum cotton okay okay yeah, interesting yeah. I, I really like it it's a lovely paper yeah mm. um, slightly really warmer it. isn't it yeah slightly warm. it is um but because i um i print black and white a little bit of warm tone in the paper is is okay mm. for me because it doesn't mm. affect the the color um and one of the big problems i was having before was the fact that i was printing black and white through the color channel so often the tiniest color shift Mm. would really throw the black and white off. So now just printing pure black and white makes that process so much simpler. Yeah. Cool. Uh, mm. So by, by that, you mean the black and white mode, the tick box? Yeah. 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 Nice. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> listen, the, the point of having you on, Paul, was to learn about Colin uh, but also because we are we are celebrating we are celebrating black and white images this April and the hashtag FS monthly. If you share your images, monochrome black and white images in April and use the hashtag FS monthly on all the social media channels uh, that Photospeed are on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Uh, we Tim and I have a look at them at the end of the month and we pick out three which are which excite us. It's not better or worse or win or lose. It's just three which leap out at us as being intriguing or whatever it is we might look for. And you will win a £50 photo speed voucher and an A3 print of your work will get sent to you, uh, done by the fantastic Mr. Jones and his magic yes. wand printing uh, <laughs> qualities. Uh, he's, he's a wizard. Uh, he, he does is. dark arts. It's all very sneaky. Um, so if you want to share your black and white images with us, please do that. And hopefully hearing from Paul has given you some inspiration behind his work and obviously just in using black and white generally. So, Paul, thank you very much for your time, my friend. Always a pleasure. And, uh, thank uh, you, Paul. Yes, and even a black and white T-shirt you did, man. Is it black and white? I can't quite tell. <laughs> It's oh, it's blue. blue. Oh, it's just a camera. Oh, all my eyes. Could be my eyes. Getting it's old. Same color as your eyes and your top. Mm, how charming. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, listen, thanks for coming along. Thanks for watching. Stay subscribed to the YouTube channel for more um, amazing videos such as this. Wink. And uh, we'll speak to you again very soon. <laughs> Goodbye for now. Right. Bye. 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 Bye.